Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure how many of you are LMS and how many are algebraic geometers or physicists. So maybe I tone down my talk a little bit. So I'm changing my title, but the talk's more or less the same. So this is going to be called cool. <laughs> uh, Virtual Cycles. Virtual, maybe Virtual Moduli Cycles. Here we go. So Francis told us what a moduli space was. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how to get invariance from moduli spaces. OK, so, so here's how it goes. Um, ever since more or less, since Donaldson, really, what, what we do is we take x, which is some geometric object, a manifold, say, or a manifold with extra structure, maybe a symplectic manifold, a Calabi R manifold, complex manifold or a four manifold or whatever it is. And then what you do is you, in Donaldson type theories, what you do is you associate to that a moduli space. So this is a manifold plus structure. This is a moduli space. So that means a parameter space, something parameterizing Solutions of a PDE on X using the additional structure, maybe, or it parameterizes geometric structures on X, complex structures on X. For instance, in the example in Francis's talk, X might be a two manifold, and then M might parameterize complex structures on X. So it would be space of Riemann surfaces or algebraic curves. Um, or this might parameterize, yeah, geometric objects on X. Holomorphic bundles on X, stable holomorphic sheaves on X, holomorphic curves in X, so solutions of Yang Mills equations, solutions of D bar equations, something like that. Okay? And then what you do is you take invariance. So now this is maybe, you should think of this as a nonlinear process, starting with a manifold and then taking solutions of some nonlinear equation. And now you've done that, you take nice ordinary linear geometric invariance of M, like it's cohomology or something. So you do something like integrate over M, or you take its cohomology. And you end up with something like numbers. Or maybe, you know, polynomials, maybe you take Poincaré polynomial, or, or, or something, some, some algebraic object. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and the things you might integrate, for instance, are insertions. So this might be a moduli space of curves in X, and then you could ask for those curves to intersect sub-varieties or points, or all the curves going through a point or something. Um, so expressing the homology classes of those insertions or those points, you take that Poincaré dual, and that gives you di certain differential forms to integrate over the moduli space. So that tells you the number of curves satisfying various incidence conditions. So these things arise very naturally in geometry. And this is, a, this is a, a way of producing interesting invariants um, <clears throat> without, you tend not to start with, uh, they're not directly invariants, they don't appear directly to be doing geometry on X, you pass through this intermediate step here. Okay. So, um, and then a linear version might be, if you consider Laplace's equation or Maxwell's equation or something, that would be where the moduli space was just, you know, the harmonic forms on X, so it would be like the cohomology of X, and then the invariant might be the dimension. And then, that way you'll get the Betty number for that. Okay, but we're more interested in nonlinear versions. We're interested in where the moduli space will be compact, so these integrals make sense. Okay, and so in maths, this is called a, this is, these are often called Donaldson type invariants or theory, and then in physics may, it might be called something like TQFT. So um, the physics point of view is important, as you'll see in a minute. So here might, what you might have is um, the moduli space is the space of um, fields satisfying uh, satisfying some kind of classical field equation. 
So you might think of something like Yang Mills Connection, something like that. And then it would sit inside some space, some ambient space of all fields. And then in um, quantum field theory, you do integrals over the space of all fields, and they localize by some least action principle to the minima of some action, which are these fields satisfying these uh, PDE. And so you, get, you localize the, the quantum field theory to this classical moduli space, and you get integrals over this moduli space. And this is Witten's reinterpretation of Thomas. So that's some general hand wavy principle. Any questions? Um, and the, the two main issues to turn this into maths. So, the, as I've stated it, it's not really maths because, um, for instance, in the second approach, this would be infinite dimensional. Uh, so that makes things difficult, as you might imagine. Uh, but the moduli space tends to be finite dimensional. Uh, so the two main issues are uh, one is sort of compactifying, compactification of M. So can you compactify M in a natural way? Make these in such a way these integrals are all finite, so the differential forms they'll extend over the boundary. So this is related to making integrals finite. Yep. And uh, this is usually understood in algebraic geometry. In the moduli spaces I'm going to consider, algebraic geometers know how to compactify. Okay? And then there's the issue still of whether your integrals extend up to compactification, but I'm not going to address that today. Um, but it's, I mean, there's a lot of interesting questions in here. For instance, in sheaf theory, which I'll be talking about later on, there's the issue of semi-stable sheaves, and that's extremely interesting, but I'm not going to address that today. Okay, so, but it, at some naive level, this is usually well understood within algebraic geometry in the, the examples I'm going to talk about. Um, but the, the issue that, I, that this talk is about is transversality. Oops. Um, of the equations. Out. So uh, I'll explain that sentence a bit better in a minute. And um, transversality is something you can't usually arrange in algebraic geometry. You don't have perturbations. You don't have enough perturbations in algebraic geometry. Things are very rigid. And um, so what you find is that in general the moduli space will be singular, not smooth. It'll be of too high a dimension. I'll try to make that more precise later on. And so um, these integrals, you shouldn't really take these integrals just over the fundamental class of the moduli space, even if it exists, even if the compactification is all dealt with. Um, you should integrate over some substitute for that, and that's called the virtual cycle. So within algebraic geometry, so not, not possible in algebraic geometry, so the substitute for this Uh, for the fundamental class, or the fundamental class of the compactification, is something called the virtual cycle. And that's what this talk's about. And this is a warm-up talk for John Jong Suk Oh's talk tomorrow, where he'll make more rigorous sense of what I'm going to discuss at the end, which is how to do this for um, sheet, stable sheaves on Calabi R4 fonts. Okay, so I, I wouldn't, what, what do I mean here? To explain. So this is a picture that really comes out of physics, I think. So this is the sort of moral, depending on your point of view, or fantasy picture. So I was always jealous of Miles for having a fantasy, Reeves fantasy. I always thought it was much cooler than an equation or a theorem. <laughs> so this is my fantasy. I'm not suggesting you name it after me. I'm just... <laughs> 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 
<laughs> it's a bit late for that. Okay, so the, the fantasy is that um, your moduli space is cut out of the smooth ambient space. You, you see, that this is not how we think of moduli spaces in algebraic geometry. You think of moduli space of sheaves or line bundles or something in algebraic geometry or curves. We don't think of it this way. It doesn't arise this way. It very rarely arises this way. But physics tells you to think about it this way. It's very important to think about it this way for what I'm going to talk about. And so it should be cut out of a smooth ambient space by a section of a vector bundle. And so this is the uh, zeros of the section of the vector bundle. And we're going to appeal to this fantasy over and over again. And so in, in uh, most examples that I have in my mind at least, this fantasy is actually true in infinite dimensions for physics reasons. So this is some infinite dimensional space. This is finite dimensional. Uh, but here the vector bundle will be infinite dimensional and the space will be infinite dimensional. Okay? Uh, and then maybe it's not so true for the compactification, but... Let's not worry about that. Yeah, so I've already divided by that, and I've ignored the singularities, and, and you're not allowed to object <laughs> for the purpose of this talk. Of course, there's going to be some lies here, but yeah, that's right. I've already divided by it, and I've thrown out, you know, the, the points with too bad a stabilizer and, and so on. That's all hidden in the compactification problem. Yeah. <coughs> um, so, yeah, so this picture is sort of true in infinite dimensions usually. But in algebraic geometry, we'd like to do all this where this is a you know, complex, smooth, holomorphic space. This is a holomorphic section. And everything's finite dimensional. And that won't be true. We won't be able to arrange that. But we'll be able to arrange weaker versions of that, which would be enough for our purposes. And uh, I'll fill you in on that as we go. And then uh, the transversality issue is that, um, so S, so if uh, the graph of S is transverse to the zero section of E along M, so just near M, right? Well, that's where it intersects, of course. Um, then, so what does that mean? That means um, ds, which is a map from the tangent space of A, M, to E to M, is on to. Uh, then M, M is smooth. Um, of the correct dimension uh, VD is the virtual dimension which is, you know, the number of unknowns dimension of A minus the number of equations And then in infinite dimensions, or um, if this is sort of infinity, infinity, minus infinity, then um, we would hope to be in a situation, we usually are from physics, that ds is actually Fredholm, and ds is Fredholm. So don't worry if you don't know what this means. It's not going to come up again. So that, oh, is it? Well, you should move down here. Then. Okay. How about green? So if this is infinity minus infinity... Have I made it worse? I'm trying to create a beautiful lecture here. Okay, 
let's try this. So, is this no good? <laughs> I, I will stick to the black in a minute, don't worry. Okay, if this is infinity minus infinity and ds is Fredholm, then you replace this by the Fredholm index. So this would be the, um, the dimension, so the rank of the kernel of ds minus the uh, rank of the co-kernel of ds. So the kernel of ds is basically the tangent space to m, and the co-kernel I want to interpret in a second. So the case we're interested in to start with is where this is onto, so then you've just got the rank of the kernel, and that's something that's kind of homotopy invariant. As you perturb S through other Fredholm operators, uh, this won't change. Okay, so we can So in that case it's just a number, yeah. Okay. So we can make sense, it's a finite number that we can make sense of in this situation. Alright. But uh, don't worry about it. We'll soon be doing algebraic geometry and everything will be finite. So it's the dimension that M should be, it's the dimension that M is when this is transverse, when these equations are transverse, all right? And then in general, there's a Sard's theorem which says if you perturb the section, so it's like the Bettini theorem from Diane, so if you perturb the section, then this will hold. For a generic perturbation, for a dense set of perturbations, you can perturb it a tiny little bit, it will satisfy this condition. Your moduli space will have the correct dimension. Okay? Now, within algebraic geometry, we, can, we can't perturb if we want to keep within algebraic or holomorphic functions. So we have to do something else. All right. So in general, what do we have? So we have this... Uh, let me write this out again. In the case it's not onto, so the kernel is something like the tangent space to M. Of course, the rank of this in general, this map here, ds, will be jumping around. So this tangent space might not be a vector bundle, it might be a sheaf or something. Its rank might be jumping from point to point. So you have to do a bit of work, but let's uh, not worry too much about that at the moment. Everything does work. Um, and then, in general, we call the co-kernel of this, so this is where all the problems are, when ds is not onto, where you're not transverse, we call this the obstruction space of M. So this is defined to be the co-kernel. So what is this? So what is op? So it's kind of the thing that's stopping your moduli space being of the correct dimension. If this has rank R, then this will have dimension R too big. So your moduli space will be too big. Okay? Well, um, so the implicit function theorem I, I looked this up yesterday on Wikipedia and it doesn't say what I'm going to attribute. I'm I'm going to give implicit here more credit than he or she deserves. Um, it, isn't, it doesn't seem to be this strong, but it ought to be this strong. Anyway, this, this statement is going to be true. I don't know who it's due to, maybe not, in, not implicit function. Uh, but the implicit function theorem roughly says, uh, says that locally about any point x in M, Right, so I've just now when I write M, I mean an open neighborhood of X. So I don't really mean the whole of M. I mean some local patch. Um, M, this sort of pointed space M X embeds in a linear space in the, really the Zariski tangent space of the moduli space at X which is the, the kernel, in fact I'll define it to be the kernel of ds restricted to x. Okay. So it embeds in this linear space with x going to the origin, so maybe I make it a pointed space. Okay. So 
M, I'm centering it at the origin in the vector space. M is just a neighborhood of M around X. Okay. As the zeros of a nonlinear map Uh, Nonlinear here means that if it is linear, it's zero. So you have um, this curve ds restricted to x, or txm, and you have this nonlinear map f. Uh, and it's really nonlinear in the sense that, so firstly, f of 0 is 0, so its first two Taylor coefficients are 0, and so its derivative at 0 is 0. Okay, so then it's higher order. Around the origin, it's quadratic, cubic, and higher order. That's the co kernel. So this, remember, this is sort of this obstruction space that I was at, that we're trying to answer what is it? So we're getting back something like the fantasy bottle again. I mean, we started with it, and now we're getting a, a smaller version. We've cut down to a finite. If, if the fantasy was infinite dimensional, we've cut down to a finite dimensional thing now. Okay, this is some minimal version of the fantasy model, where we've taken the smallest possible smooth ambient space, this linear space here, this tangent space. So that's the linear approximation moduli space. We're approximating at this stage f by just a linear function in the direction of normal to n, and uh, we're embedding m inside its tangent space. Okay? But there are higher order pieces to f. There's corrections, nonlinear corrections, if df, if you're not transverse. So if you're transverse and the derivative is onto, then there are no higher order corrections. You can always wiggle your nonlinear moduli space to fit in its linear tangent space. They're locally isomorphic. But if you have some co-kernel, remember the co-kernel, that only saw the, the first order piece of the section normal to the moduli space. So that only saw the first order piece of the Taylor expansion of S away from M. And then all the higher order stuff is pack, packaged into this function. And this is the so-called Kuranishi model of a local patch of the moduli space. All right, so the, the obstruction space is where all the higher order corrections to the linear approximation, where they lie. Does that make sense? Does anyone know what, what theorem this really is? This not the, I feel this, should, this is what the implicit function theorem should say. Now, linear first number Which matrix? Well, the second derivative. The, so if you take the second derivative of F, so the leading part of this, then it would be s symmetric. But I'm, I'm interested in all parts, unfortunately. Um, right, your, the, the YouTube or whatever is not watching that screen, is that correct? So I should work over here. So there's a few things to notice. One, it, one is this again looks like the fantasy model. You have a, you have a smooth ambient space, a, ve a, a vector bundle here. It's just a trivial vector bundle. This vector space times my smooth ambient space, and a section cutting out my moduli space locally. So I have a local version of this fantasy picture. I've cut down, you know, my space and my equations by the same amount by some infinite number of variables and infinite number of equations if, if I started with something infinite. I've cut down by how many dimensions? The rank of ds restricted to x. So the, the linear piece 
I've, I've managed to cut both by, you know, I've cut this sound by and I've cut this sound by, and I've, I've produced, I've ended up with something uh, much smaller here. But th this is the smallest possible thing you can end up with, uh, and um, that's supposed to, the main point of this, this board was to try and explain what, how you should think about this obstruction space. Okay? And then, this thing here, this description of a moduli space locally looking like its tangent space, uh, looking like it's cut out of its tangent space by some higher order equations, is something you already see in deformation theory. So this last description is sort of um, familiar in the mathematician sense of the word familiar. That means maybe I'm not going to explain it all. And so I'll claim that you already know it. Uh, from deformation theory, um, in many cases. So we already see this kind of picture. So e.g., I'm going to give one example. So e.g., if M is a moduli space of, let's say, stable uh, bundles or sheaves, holomorphic sheaves, on some X, which is, you know, smooth, projective variety. And my point in M, my little X there, would be some F, which is a sheaf on X. Okay, then this tangent space at F to M is x1 on x f f, and this obstruction space at f in m is uh, x2 f f. And standard deformation theory, due to Kuranishi in the 60s, which is my excuse for not proving it all and explaining it all, um, Kurinishi gives then a description, a local description of M, uh, I think local analytic description of M, um, as in So in algebraic geometry, deformation theory around a point of the moduli space gives you a descript it tells you the tangent space, and then you can do higher order obstruction, tan uh, deformation and obstruction theory to see what your moduli space looks like to higher order, whether it still looks like the tangent space or whether you, you get some constraints. And what you find if you do this to all order, all orders, is precisely a picture like this. So here the linear space will be x1, here the linear space will be x2, there's some nonlinear map between them. The zeros of that map include the origin and describe the local analytic structure of M around the point F. Is that okay? For time. What, what time did we start at? 20 to. We started half an hour ago. Okay, great. We're okay. Okay, so even though we don't have this global picture in algebraic geometry that we'd like, we do have these local versions of it, often. And so it's going to turn out that this will be enough. Just the fact that locally our moduli space looks like this will be enough to do everything we would do in this picture, like try and perturb the section, get a better version of the moduli space, which is smaller of the correct dimension. That'll be enough 
just from this kind of data. Okay. So in this case, uh, this sort of suggests that you take the virtual dimension to be the dimension of this guy, which we call little x1, minus the dimension of this guy, so number of unknowns minus number of equations. But this isn't going to work in general because this might jump around. And if it does jump around, what you should think of is that the, your moduli space is like being embedded maybe in a smooth space, but being cut out by a section of a sheet rather than a vector bundle. So some singularities. That's not the situation we want. You don't have good perturbation theory for that. Or it's like being embedded in a singular space and being cut out by a vector bundle. So if this jumps around, you're in trouble. So if this is constant, If this is constant, then um, you're probably in a good situation, and actually, more or less, that's what the theorem is saying. If you're in this situation, that this is given by a constant, then you'll be able to do, you'll be able to produce one of these virtual moduli cycles that I'm going to get to in a bit. Okay, so e.g., so e.g., if dim x is less or equal to then you can't have any higher x. And so uh, Riemann Rock will give this constant. Riemann Rock will say that this minus this is a constant because, in general, the alternating sum, HOM minus x1 plus x2 minus x3 and so on, is a constant. Excuse me. HOM is always going to be constant for us because I'm treating stable sheaves and they only ever have scalar automorphisms. So HOM is always just one dimensional. So it's always constant. So if you've got no higher x, then this will be given by a Riemann-Roch constant. This will be given by a topological formula on x in the churn classes of your bundle, f. Okay. So, so you'll be able to get one of these virtual cycles. So dimension x equals 2 is Donaldson theory. Um, but another example is um, Calabi R3 folds. So here, x3, for instance, uh, maybe x3 is by ser duality this is dual to hom ff dual which is just a copy of the complex numbers it's just um, multiples of the identity because I'm going to I've skated over this but I'm dealing with moduli spaces of stable sheets okay so um, in this case this is constant and then higher x, x4 is said dual to x minus 1, which is 0, and so on. So, um, so sort of vd is well defined. In fact, it turns out it's 0, because x1 is dual to x2 in that case. And so uh, vd is 0, and we get, a, we get a virtual cycle. Okay, so in this case, you get uh, Donaldson invariance. And here you get, I haven't told you how yet, that's the rest of the talk, but you get invariance. So by integrating over this zero-dimensional virtual cycle, you just integrate one over it. In other words, you count the number of points in this cycle. Uh, then these are what people call DT invariants. Okay. So um, another non-EG is Calabi R4 folds. Because x3 there can be non-zero. So you've got deformations, you've got obstructions, but you've also got sort of relations amongst the obstructions or higher obstructions. So here x3 is x1 dual is in general non-zero. So this doesn't work. And that's what um, the very end of my talk will briefly touch on and John Sook's talk tomorrow will explain how to get around it. Okay. So I'm going to leave up my fantasy. So um, 
the thing we need is something called the perfect obstruction theory. So this is a linearized version of the fantasy. Uh, so that, that's more or less this data here. Um, but we're algebraic geometers, so we always dualize everything. We always work with the dual of everything just to intimidate differential geometers. So let's do that. And then, uh, so really what I'm interested in is, is this E dual goes via ds to the cotangent bundle of A restricted to M. That's the linearized fantasy, if you like. That's the thing I'm interested in. And then the fact that the kernel here was the tangent space and the co-kernel was the obstruction space is sort of a more global, uh, working over the whole of M, dualized, better version of that is the following. It's this diagram. So we take the section that maps to pi mod i squared, which goes from our D to this guy. Okay, so here i is the ideal sheath of M. So roughly this is the co normal bundle to M in A. I'm just differentiating functions here to end up here. And I map onto this via sections of E dual. Okay, that's just the that's just the statement that S generates this ideal. Alright, this ideal was defined by S. You know, M was cut out by S. Right? So this this is the um, fancy algebraic geometry way of describing what I was talking about before. And then uh, right, sorry, I'm going to use different colour now. Right, so here we're sort of ob dual. Well, I won't be too precise about what I mean by dual, don't worry about it. It all works out in the wash. This will be um, the cotangent sheaf of M. And then this is something. So I'm just completing this diagram, I'll, I'll explain it in a second. Okay, this thing here, this is called the truncated cotangent complex of M. This is intrinsic to M, so even though I constructed it out of A, this object is independent of choices. It's independent of the choice of, um, ah, sorry, in its quasi-isomorphism class in the derived category of sheaves is independent of choices. Okay, so if I if I expand the ambient space, I'll also expand the co-normal bundle. The two will sort of cancel out. And up to quasi-isomorphism, I'll get the same complex. Right. So this is an intrinsic invariant of M. And it's roughly, you know, when when this is when M is smooth or LCI or something, this embeds in there and it's quasi-isomorphic to just this. So it's um, if M smooth or LCI, then it's just LM is the cotangent sheaf of M. Okay. But anyway, it's, it's an intrinsic invariant of M, this thing. Okay. This uh, is its minus one sheaf cohomology, in other words, the kernel of this map, and this is its zeroth cohomology. Okay. So this is the linearized version of the fantasy, this is what it gives. And then this is the thing. So the fantasy is just that. It doesn't, we don't usually have it. But this we often do have. So this is called the perfect obstruction theory. So definition. This is due to Kai Berend and Barbara Fantaki. Um, a perfect obstruction theory. is a two-term complex, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, a two-term complex of vector bundles, so this is all on M, so I call it E dot, one in degree minus one, one in degree zero. Really, I mean it's 
class in the drive category, so it's only really defined up to quasi-isomorphism. Um, and, a, and a morphism, or a map, in the drive category, phi from E dot to this cotangent complex of M, such that H naught of phi is an isomorphism H0, the, the zeroth cohomology of this complex is just the cotangent sheaf of M. And uh, H minus 1 of phi, the induced map, so that, that's this one. H minus 1 is this one, is a subjection. Right. So what this is saying is that, so you should think of E dot as this thing. If you're in the fantasy situation, these are both vector bundles, because A was smooth, so this is a vector bundle, this is a vector bundle, this is two-term complex of vector bundles, that's my E dot. Right. And what it's saying is that two-term complex of vector bundles, it's, it's kernel, it gives you the cotangent space, that's just like up here, the, sorry, co-kernel, just the dual statement to up here, the kernel being the tangent space. And it's co-kernel. It's saying it's co-kernel. The fact it's surjective, when you dualize, that means it's an injection from here to here. What it says is that the intrinsic obstruction space of M embeds in our obstruction space. So our obstruction space is big enough to see all possible obstructions that might arise in M. All right? So there's this intrinsic kind of obstruction space, the smallest possible version of an obstruction space, which comes from sort of embedding M in the smallest possible linear space. Um, Anyway, there's, there's an intrinsic notion of obstruction space, and it should embed in our obstruction space. So our obstruction space is big enough to see all possible higher-order obstructions to my uh, deforming inside my moduli space. Okay? And this, look at this vector bundle condition, this fact that these are vector bundles, is, that, is roughly speaking the condition that VD is constant, this virtual dimension. Okay, so now VD is the rank of E dot. So it's the, it's the rank of E0 minus the rank of E minus 1. The fact that that's constant is that, roughly speaking, the condition that these two should be back buttons. Their ranks don't jump. All right? Um, and more or less, in nature, if ever, if ever this happens, that this is constant, there'll be one of these. It's not a true theorem. You can certainly create pathological examples where this is a constant and there is no such two-term resolution. But in nature, anywhere you find that this is constant, you'll find a virtual cycle. You've just got to do 100 pages of deformation. Okay, so this is a... This, so this is the linearized version. Okay, so let me try and sum up what we did. We have this global fantasy. That doesn't hold in algebraic geometry. Locally, it holds in algebraic geometry in lots of situations, and that was this um, that was this deformation theory here. So we found a local description. Locally, analytically, we saw that the moduli space often does have a fantasy model, and this is the statement or an assumption that globally the moduli space has the linearization of the fantasy. So the the fantasy doesn't hold, but to first order away from the moduli space, it does hold. Okay. And, and that, should, that should hold globally. That's what this assumption is. And then the fact is that this is a useful definition. There's many, many, almost any situation where this is a constant uh, will have one of these perfect obstructions. All right. And then it turns out that once you have one of these, this is enough to give us, to define... Uh, this M ver in the Chow or homology, you should think of this as homology of M with good properties. This can be enough to give us a virtual cycle which has all the right properties. In particular, if you can perturb the setup so that M has the correct dimension, the cycle you'll get from its fundamental cycle will be this one. And it has lots and lots of good properties which say it's deformation invariant. Yeah, it's the right object. Okay? 
bit. And this is like, this is the chair version of homology in degree two times VD. So I have to explain how we do this. Remember I said locally you have these Kuranishi models, so locally we have the fantasy picture, so what's that, that's sort of here's your ambient space M, here's your vector bundle over it, you have a section remember, and now you have some red, just to exclude Balash. Okay, and where, where it intersects, where the, zero, where the section zero is your modular space. All right? Now, how would you intersect them? One thing you can do is you can replace S by T times S. So, this is the graph of S. What I'm going to do now, remember, I don't really have A. This is just my fantasy. So, what I want to do is make this more and more vertical to get rid of A. So I don't have to use A, I only have to use M, which I really have, M exists, A doesn't exist, except in my imagination. Okay, so what I'm going to do is take, replace S by TS, take its graph, and then take the limit as T goes to infinity. Okay, so the obvious homotopy, and then I get this picture here, there was A, this was E, here's my moduli space. And that, that graph has become vertical, and I end up with something called a cone in my vector bundle. So this is a cone, which means it's C star invariant. It's invariant under scale. Okay. And now, this is good, because this lies only, lies only over N. It no longer uses A. So, what Baron and Pantecki do, the BF show, that even though these local models don't glue, this guy does glue. Show that C in E glues. So, these local patches have up to some choices to make all the E's have the right rank and so on. You can make sure that this all glues. Okay? Sorry? You intend the restricted to it. Thank you. Very important. Correct. So this really glues to give me a global. So it's really global. Right. And that's great because now instead of intersecting this graph with the zero section, I can do it over here and just intersect the cone with the zero section of M. Just M. So I can define. To be, I'm going to use Fulton's notation. So E restricted to M is sort of E1. It's the dual of that. It's the dual of, of that E minus 1 over here. So I'm in E1 on M. Okay? So what I do is I, I intersect with the zero section of E1 on M uh, this code. That's in A, B, D, and then M. I have to tell you what this operator is. So that's intersection with the zero section. inverse of, you know, essentially the algebraic version of the Tom isomorphism, where the Tom isomorphism goes from uh, the A, let me see, yeah, A, B, D, plus the rank of E1, B, D, F. OK? 
Okay, so, you know, you have E1, this is vector bundle pi over M, and it's total space, then you can pull back cycles from M to E1, you get an isomorphism. And intersection with the zero section is the inverse. It's just defined to be the inverse. Okay, so I don't have to do these in the, these these isomorphisms. You know, I'm using algebra cycles, so I have my algebra cycles have coefficients which are negative numbers. Oh, sorry, which are <laughs> which are allowed to include negative numbers. Uh, so I don't have to do any perturbations now. I'm, I'm allowed to intersect things which. I maybe can't intersect by moving. So this is um, Fulton and McPherson's way of doing intersection theory without a moving lemma. So by, by allowing negative numbers, you can intersect, for instance, a minus one curve with itself by taking the first chunk class of its normal bundle. Um, even though you can never move the minus one curve off itself, by allowing negative numbers, by allowing cycles with negative coefficients, you can perfectly well define first Chern class of the O minus 1 line bundle on a P1 is minus a point. So um, that's why this, this here looks like a bit of magic and you don't, I don't have to do any perturbations anymore. Okay, so um, I should end. How am I doing? Okay, five minutes. So I apologize if you're, if you're just here for the LMS talk. I appreciate after about 20 minutes I went completely out of our geometric. Okay. So um, this works for many, many problems. All the enumerative algebra geometry problems you've heard of, like gromov witten theory, are all underpinned by this technology. Uh, what it doesn't work for is sheaves on Calabi I4 faults. Okay, so now I give my talk for the M cubed conference. Here, as I said, you have this X, you have this X3 is equal to X1, so you're in trouble. But you, you've got higher obstructions or relations between the obstructions. What's that? You. Okay. You. I didn't hear that. It's not E, but it's U. Ah, but it's a, it's a little E. It's a dimension. Okay. Uh, so uh, what you find is that, you know, the thing I'm after, by x1 minus x2, sort of number of unknowns minus number of equations, this is not a constant, but... I, but if I put plus x3 here, or x1, then this is a constant by Riemann Rock. Okay. So using that, look, that's, that's, in other words, this is two lots of x1 minus a half x2. Okay. This is a constant. So x1 minus x2 is not, that's bad. But this, what this suggests is maybe you can halve the obstruction space. Suggests halving the obstruction space. And now getting a perfect obstruction theory and doing everything before. Okay. And that doesn't quite work. You know, usually if you halve the obstruction space, it won't be an obstruction space anymore. It won't contain enough information to contain all the obstructions. It doesn't quite work, but uh, there is a way it works over the real numbers. So Borisov and Joyce found a way of doing this. So what they started with was um, now what you find is, first of all, due to results of Team Joyce. So let me see. So Bussy, Brav, Ben Bassett, lots of Bs, and a Joyce and also Uziz and Gronowski, show that the local model now, which I don't have time to explain, this, this comes from some very natural and easy to understand geometry, but I, I can't do it now. So the local model now 
is much like before, but slightly different. So you have the moduli space cut inside a smooth ambient space, cut out by a section of a vector bundle. But it's, it's really an orthogonal bundle. It has a quadratic form on it. It's a quadratic bundle. So that's Q. And the section is isotropic, so Q, S, S, 0. So this is an S, O, you know, R, C bundle. It has a quadratic form on it. Um, not, not yet. No, I'm not. We can handle R. 2R is, I agree, much simpler. <laughs> but we can handle R as well. Okay. Um, and it's... Um, what was I on about? Okay. So this section isn't taking values anywhere in E because it's isotropic. And so, the, you know, the... the um, the linearized version is that you have, you know, T A restricted to M goes to E restricted to M D S here. But remember, E is isomorphic to E dual using this quadratic form, and therefore there's a map. There's the dual. You can take the dual of this map, which really goes from E dual, right? And then that goes to the cotangent bundle of A. This is the is the linearized form. This is the complex, is the, you know, R hom F, F complex uh, that computes the tangent space, the obstruction space, the higher obstruction space, all these x to i, one x, okay? And what we want to do is we want to halve it. Okay, I'm going to have to use on. What we'd like to do is do that. We'd like to throw that guy away. That wouldn't be quasi-isomorphism invariant. That'd be a terrible thing to do. But we want to throw away half of E at the same time. That would be a nicer thing to do. Okay? So in other words, uh, what you should think of is sort of D this DS here is taking values, not in the full E, but in the kernel of DS dual here. This. And so that's some half to uh, yeah, that's hard to make sense of. It jumps around. But anyway, what we want to do is halve E in some sense. Okay. And what Borisov and Joyce do is they say, well, SORC is homotopy equivalent to SORR. And what that amounts to is that E is actually the complexification of a real bundle of half the rank. This is really a, a, a real bundle with a quadratic form on it, a metric. And so they replace E and S by ER, this half dimensional E, and then S plus, let's say. So, so here, if I write S is S plus and S minus with respect to this decomposition. So this is not algebraic geometry, this is real differential geometry. And then the, the QSS condition, the being isotropic condition, says essentially that the quadratic form on here, which is some kind of metric on ER, satisfies that this condition. Okay? So what that says is that the norm of S squared, if you use any odd metric on my original E, this is mod S plus squared plus S minus squared, so by this, it's just 2 s plus squared. So what you find is, in other words, s vanishes whenever s plus vanishes. So at least set theoretically, s inverse of 0 is s plus inverse of 0. So in other words, by passing to this sort of maximal, positive, definite, real subbundle, we don't lose any information. If we just project our section to that component, it doesn't have any extra zeros. So we can kind of throw away half the equations, and we still get the same, we cut out the same moduli space. Okay? And so what this allows you to do gives you a virtual cycle. All right? And then uh, I will end by just saying what jong -suk and I do is instead we try and do this within algebraic geometry, and we find a way of doing it by instead of using this model of splitting E into a real part 
and i times a real path. What we do is sort of try and split it locally into a maximal isotropic plus its dual. So this has an obvious symmetric quadratic form on it, given by pairing these two, right? Um, and then what we try and do is split the section into two pieces and project, and it doesn't work. We don't get this condition. This doesn't hold anymore. So when you halve the bundle in this way, you find that the it doesn't give you a perfect obstruction theory. The, if you sort of split the section between the two pieces, you just take one half of it, it'll have too big a zero locus. It'll be way bigger than the moduli space. So nothing works. But then we use a fix for that using something called cosection localization, which fixes that, which somehow uses the other piece as well in a tricky way. And John Suk will say something about that tomorrow. Uh, so there's two issues. One is, in general, this doesn't exist. You can't always split a bundle in this way but you can't find a maximal isotropic subbundle, especially as mass said, unless r is even, but we have ways around all that. Uh, so that's one issue. You have to pass to a certain cover of the moduli space to make this lambda exist and push down later. And then you have to do this trick because you don't have this wonderful property that Borisov and Joyce exploited, that when you halve the section, you still cut out the same moduli space. It turns out, when you halve the section in algebra geometry, you've really thrown away too many equations, and suddenly you're not cutting out the same. You're cutting out something too big. Okay? So, John Suk will explain how we get around that. And uh, the upshot is that we managed to produce a virtual cycle within algebraic geometry, and then prove it's equal to Borisov and Joyce's virtual cycle. So, it, it makes sense to define these so-called DT4 invariants in algebraic geometry. Um, there was one other thing I was going to say. Oh yeah, you should just observe that if you have maximal isotropic holomorphic subbundles of even rank quadratic bundles, by projection to this piece, they're actually isomorphic over the real numbers as real vector bundles. This is isomorphic to this. So what we're doing is not crazy. It's, it's related to what Borisov and Joyce do. Um, but the motivation is to produce this virtual cycle within algebraic geometry because then it's computable. Borisov and Joyce is, is really not computable. Uh, but ours has a torus localization formula and various generalizations. It means you can actually compute them. Uh, but I leave that to John Sook tomorrow, so I'll stop there.